You came here to learn about some Heroku, hopefully. The people in the back are just trying to find a chair, I think. But some of you are here to learn about Heroku, right? Both. You wanted to sit down and you wanted to place. You know, they don't have chairs for us at the booths here. I've been standing at these booths for days. It's inhumane what they do to it. It's okay. It's worth it so that I can educate you about Heroku. Uh, in the process of this presentation, I'm going to give you probably... This uh, little timer in the corner is going to get real annoying. How are you supposed to be turning that off? Let's see if I can figure that out real quick for you. I apologize. I'm not sure why that decided to show up. How about now? There we go. All right. So um, in the process of making this presentation, I am most likely going to be making some forward-looking statements in an effort to trick you into buying stock. Do not fall for it, OK? I'm a fun guy, but you don't want to spend time in prison with me, probably. It's just a lot of crying. It's not fun, all right? So what is Heroku is the question. I'm going to teach you about Heroku here. And a lot of you came here knowing that Heroku was a thing, probably, uh, but not so much what Heroku is specifically, right? So this is your life as a developer in 1994, right? You show up to your first job as a developer, and they hand you a keyboard, and they hand you a server, and they say, good luck, kid. Have fun, right? Go make us a website. And you own everything. You own the application and the operating system all the way down to the servers itself. You're crawling in the ceiling and plugging in network cables, right? Your life is terrible. And then we have this company show up, Amazon Web Services. Anybody heard of Amazon Web Services? This AWS thing is catching on, I think. You should check into that, OK? So they made our lives so much easier as developers, right? Now we can focus on our application instead of focusing on all this other nonsense we don't care about. We were a little skeptical about this cloud thing at first. I feel like people are pretty much on board today, right? Not a whole lot of people start their new company by ordering servers from China, right? This is how it works now. So the nice thing about this is that it gave us an opportunity to focus on our application a little bit more. But it didn't let us focus on it full time, because there was actually kind of a lot of hidden complexity there that we didn't know about at the time. Things like scaling, right? Logs, compliance, monitoring, orchestration. Those are all difficult pieces that we have to deal with as developers today that we didn't have to deal with before, right? And we have a solution for you now. And that thing is a platform as a service. That's Heroku, right? That's what I'm here to talk about today, is about allowing Heroku as a platform to offload that section of your responsibilities. So you as a developer can once more focus on what you're really good at, which is coding and building features for your users, right? No one understands your business like you understand your business. You should be spending your time building the things that matter and offload all of the administrivia to other people, right? So these are the languages that you can use on Heroku. This is not an exclusive list. You can use lots of languages on Heroku, in fact, all of them. But in order to use languages that are not on this list, you're using a third-party build system, right? You put, put together a build pack to do that. These are the ones that we are likely to answer the telephone about, right? If you're using one of these supported languages, to be very clear, this is not for your Apex code, right? For the purposes of this discussion, consider this a separate world. This is when you've decided you need to build a custom application, something bespoke off to the side. We've got to build this Node app or this PHP app. Where are we going to put the code online so we make sure it stays online and scales? That's Heroku. That's what you want to use Heroku for. Still clicking. You know, I'm going to give up on the clicker situation. None of that's working. I have a space bar that works just fine. How about this? OK. Developer, your new world, right? You deploy the code. That ends your responsibility as a developer. You're really good at writing code and building features for your customers. End the story there. And let us take care of the rest. So what Heroku is going to do is we're going to get a dyno running for you. And that's where your code is going to live. That's a container, all right? Nine years ago when Heroku was created, containers were not really a thing yet, right? So we came up with this technology. It was founded in a very similar way to the way Docker came to be. It's built on LXC on top of Linux, if you're nerdy enough to care about those types of things. Uh, but this is a smart container, right? The difference between this and a Docker container is that when you're running one of these dynos on Heroku, it's going to scale automatically for you. You can set it up so that as users make more requests to your web application, as you get that retweet from OPA that takes your daily users from 1,000 to 3.5 million, and your web app goes down. We see it all the time, right? Anyone remember the fail whale from Twitter we used to see all the time? That was their application error page. That's what happens when your web app gets too much traffic unexpectedly. That is not a problem on Heroku. Unlike every other web application on the internet, if you are running on Heroku, your app gets faster as it gets more requests. As a developer, you can manage your Heroku assets through the CLI or the dashboard. So you're not giving anything up. You used to be able to SSH into your server and mess around with tarballs and install things. You can still do that on Heroku. You just won't have to anymore, right? You can spend your time focusing on the things that matter. 
Scalable data storage. I talked about how our dynos scale up, how we can have multiple containers. That is also true of your data situation, right? When you put a database on Heroku, you can count on it to scale. Your add-ons and all of your databases will scale with you as you grow. There's no risk that you're going to go onto Heroku and outgrow it someday. We are running Heroku right now on billions of requests a day, right? And we scale infinitely with you. So when you put your app on Heroku today, you can trust that tomorrow you're not going to be changing providers unless you want to. We actually encourage you to build your application in such a way that you treat the file system as being ephemeral. And that makes it very portable. It was probably a poor business decision on our part. We should have put some deeper hooks in there. We actually encourage you to build your app in a way that makes it easy for you to leave. There's no lock-in on Heroku. Uh, that being said, the lock-in is that you will love it so much you never want to leave. Your users only have to have a fantastic experience. They make the requests, they're routed to the correct dyno, and they leave happy. So this is how we do it on the command line. You say, Heroku, create my first app, right? And what this does is it's going to create that dyno for you that I was talking about. Now we just have this empty box, and we've got to get the code in there, right? How do you get your code up on Heroku? You do this. You say git push Heroku master. So just like you were pushing to GitHub before to share your code with your colleagues or whatever Git provider you're using, now we've added the git remote for Heroku. So you say git push Heroku master. Heroku catches it. And you've now thrown all of your problems of shipping a production application over the fence to us. And now it's our problem, right? which turns out to be not a problem at all. We immediately detect that you're running PHP. We know that you need these exact versions of PHP in the Apache, and we install them. We find your composer file, and we install your application dependencies from there. And we give you back a URL. And this entire process, start to finish, takes about 30 seconds on Heroku. So you just had an idea for a startup up there at the top. You typed two commands, and you shipped your code to Heroku in a way that will now scale to billions of requests. That's a thing that I don't think you'll be able to accomplish on another platform. In fact, I've tried it several times, and I have never done it. I challenge you to do so. That ease of developer experience, that's brought us to a place where we're processing 23 billion requests a day. Heroku itself is built on Heroku, right? We're dogfooding our own product. So those 23 billion requests, they're coming through Heroku too. Trust me when I tell you this thing scales. We have 7 million apps already on the platform and more than 150 add-on services. I've told you about these add-on services a couple of times, but I have yet to tell you what an add-on actually is, right? So this is what an add-on is. When I showed you this diagram earlier, I was lying to you, unfortunately. And I'm sorry, but it was for a good reason. I wanted to slow the process of learning here. So this is not all you do now, right, as a developer, because someday the boss is going to walk into your office and say, you know, we just got this user feedback here. We know what the users want now. They want more spam. They desperately need more email in their lives, right? Your application is going to have to send emails. So you've got to add email. And that's kind of outside of your just code rule, right? You used to be able to just code, but now you've got to do this email thing. So you've got to go find an email gateway, blah, 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 right? Same is true of something like a CDN. Even a database, if you want to add a database to your application, that's going to involve a setup on any other platform, right? On Heroku, this is what that looks like. So for my little example application here, for email, I'm going to choose Mailgun. Now, this is just one of many providers in the Heroku add-ons ecosystem. You can have your choice. But when I go on to Heroku and I find the, the Mailgun add-on and I click that button, what happens in the background is Heroku goes to Mailgun and creates an account for you and generates an API key and sets it on your application. So you as a developer never leave your code. You can just keep typing code as though email works, because now it magically does, because you clicked a button on our website. The same is true for a CDN, like Fastly. The same is true for a database, like Postgres. These are all part of our add-ons ecosystem. And I promised you earlier you could do anything on the command line that you can do in the website. This is what that looks like. From the command line, I say, Heroku add-ons create Mailgun. And now I have email, or Fastly, or Postgres. And if you're paying close attention, you'll notice this last one here is Heroku add-ons create Heroku PostgresQL. That one says Heroku twice. That's super redundant. Why would we name it that? We named it that because we made it. We own this add-on. In fact, we are the largest purveyor of handcrafted artisanal Postgres databases in the world. We're very good at this game. If you are using a database that is not Postgres, you should strongly consider moving to Postgres. If you're building a new application, please use Postgres. I honestly don't care if you are running Postgres on Heroku. I would like it, and you would like it, and you would be a happier person. But if you are going to choose a database for a new uh, application, Postgres is the correct answer. And I am happy to explain all of the detailed reasons I have for believing that afterwards. But please use Postgres. Your life will be much easier as a developer. Heroku provides many, many Postgres databases. Postgres is a fantastic database, but sometimes when you are running it in production at a scale, it is hard to know which knobs to turn. 
Some of the people who work for us at Heroku actually commit to the Postgres open source project itself. Right? We have many, many Postgres experts inside the house. You can trust them to take this thing and make sure that it doesn't go down when you get retweeted by Oprah and your app becomes suddenly very popular. Right? We have another add-on here in Redis. Redis, if you are unfamiliar, is really good for PubSub when you're trying to get multiple applications to talk to each other in kind of a disposable way. It's great for caching. Heroku offers that natively as well. We have a great demo over in the booth in the developer forest. If you get a chance to stop by and check out the Heroku booth, there's a video game that uses this Redis extensively. Kafka. I like to talk for kind of a long time about Kafka because I'm in love with this technology. So I imagine many of you at one point had a monolithic application inside your company, right? You just kept coding on this big thing and it got giant and unwieldy and terrible. And then you went to a conference and someone said, you know, you could try microservices instead. And now instead of one big problem, you have a thousand tiny problems, right? You built all of these tiny microservices and sometimes this application is supposed to tell this one, hey, send an email. But the message never gets there, and no one knows that it was even supposed to have been sent, right? It's a tree falling in the forest, and no one hears a sound, and that's what HTTP is. It's kind of our form as developers for trusting HTTP to do this job, where you're making the API request and it actually happens. HTTP is stateless. It's not designed to do that. Kafka is designed to do that. Honestly, over the next 10 years, this or a technology like it is going to dominate the way we build applications. We're moving towards an event-based architecture. What this means is that in Kafka's world, when Kafka sends a message, if this application is down and doesn't get the message, then Kafka just leaves it there. And when the app comes up, it gets the message, right? HTTP is a different situation. I equate this to your postal carrier walking down the street and just burning your mail as they go and dropping it on the ground. Because HTTP, when it sends that message, if this app is offline, the message is gone into the ether. And this app comes back and is like, hey, do I have any messages? I don't know who you are, the other app says. And we move on with our lives. That's the world right now with HTTP, and that's why microservices are painful. So the solution is not retreat back to the monolith. Please don't do that. Monoliths are also a bad idea. But if you're trying to build a sustainable microservices architecture, you need something that can pass these events around in a disk-backed way like Kafka 10. So if you haven't had a chance to learn about it, go online and read about Apache Kafka. And when you're done and you realize that this is something you're going to want to run in production, Come back to Heroku and trust us to do it. We're one of very few companies in the world who is today offering a managed Kafka cluster. It's a button just like anything else on Heroku. You can set up your own Kafka cluster and not worry about that postman burning all of your letters anymore. OK? Finally, this is a piece that is particularly relevant to you as Salesforce developers. This is Heroku Connect. Has anyone heard of Heroku Connect before? Kind of like the Heroku situation, maybe you know what it is but haven't used it. Heroku Connect is a huge boon to Salesforce developers. This basically allows you to take information in your Salesforce org and bi-directionally sync it into one of those fantastic Postgres databases I've been telling you about. Right? So you've got your new Ruby application over here. You built your Ruby on Rails app. It's sitting on top of a Postgres string. It's supposed to be like a lead gen tool for your salespeople who are walking around in the field, and they want to edit the leads over here. But then you've got to go and make all these API requests and make sure everything stays synchronized. This does that for you. right? So your salespeople out in the field, they use your new Rails app, and they edit one of those leads, and it syncs over here. And someone back in the office changes it in the Salesforce org, and it syncs over there. And it's very, very fast. It's an excellent product. We have a demo about it over there in the developer forest again. On the back side, if you want to go and check out Heroku Connect, there's a lot more to learn about it than I've been able to give you here. But you should definitely check it out. So that is the end of my spiel. And I'm actually going to attempt to live create a new Heroku app with you so that I can show you in code what I've just shown you here on the slides if people are interested in that plan. Yeah? You ready to try it? So we're going to go over here to a command line. I'm here in my Dreamforce. How much? Can you see that OK? In Biggin? OK. So I've got nothing in this directory right now, right? I want to create a new PHP application on Heroku. So I'm just going to use Vim here, and I'm editing my PHP file. And I'm going to type in here some real good PHP. I'm a PHP expert, actually. Um, so I, this is not actually expert PHP. It's not actually PHP at all. That's just HTML, which turns out can be interpreted as PHP in a pinch, like if you need a demo site and you don't have a lot of time to write some PHP, right? So, We've got a hello Dreamforce message here on our empty page, right? And I exit out of here. And now I'm going to create a Heroku application, right? So I say Heroku create. Oh, hi, Dreamforce. Like this, OK? And just like I promised, Heroku is going to give us back one of those dinos. We're done. We got a dino, right? And now I say git push Heroku master. And I can't because I didn't set this up as a git repository yet, which was part of the trick. And I forgot. So these are steps that you're not actually going to have to take. 
when you are doing this, because you already have your, your application set up with a GitHub repo, pres presumably. But now we've got our first commit. We're in a Git repo. And I say git push Roku master, right? And I can't do that, because I didn't want to anyway. It was a lie. And I have to actually have had that already before I did the Heroku create. This is the problem with live demos. Let's say I want to do Heroku git remote. Is that how I do this? With an A like this. OK. So there we go. We now have our Heroku git remote. So this is the, the magic. What I just did. Uh, and looked a little bit wonky there. I want to explain. So Git uses a system of remotes, right? When you're pushing up to GitHub, you've got origin over here. And so when we use the Heroku CLI, it automatically creates a, a remote for you for Heroku if you're in a Git repository. <laughs> if I hadn't created the Git repository yet, then it wouldn't have done that. But now we're good. And I say Git push Heroku master, right? And now Git detects that I have a PHP app. It's going to get very angry about my composer. Yes. It says, you know, you can't just like make an index.php file and call that an app. This is not a real app. It wants a composer JSON file. That was the part that installs the PHP dependencies, but that's fine. And we're done, actually. That's the whole story. So now when I say Heroku open, this opens up my page here in this browser that says Hello Dreamforce. And I just shipped a PHP application on Heroku, albeit quite a boring one, right? <laughs> not a terribly interesting browser or interesting um, application. So let's go over here to our, let's see here. I'm going to go back over here to my repository. And I'm going to turn this thing into an actual repo real quick, OK? And I'll explain why I'm doing this. But it's not important right now. I'm just on GitHub. I've gone to the new repository page, and I've created this repo. And now I can push my repository from the command line, right? So I come over here, and I push this up to master on, on my GitHub side. And now I have a git remote, a git remote, not a git remove, that is set up for GitHub, right? So I can push my awesome new code to GitHub, just like I did. I already did push in this case. So getting a GitHub repo into the story actually gives us a huge advantage in that I can go into my applications list here, and I have already, presumably, found this application, but I'm going to find it again. Uh, let's see here. We'll just go to Cloudspear, and I'll hop over from my apps client here. So I've got this Ohi Dreamforce loaded up eventually, not so much, like this. Go to the page. Think we are experiencing some internet troubles, or else I am not very good at finding apps called Ohi Dreamforce. Here it is. All right, that's what I wanted. OK. So here's your application dashboard on Heroku, right? And I was talking about how we can create more dynos or bigger ones. So we'll go over here under our Resources tab, and we are going to change how we have our dynos set up. We're going to take it from a free one to a very expensive one, because my boss is sitting over here, and he said, it's cool. Spend all the company's money, no problem. So we got that set up. And now more than that, we're going to use the biggest one we've got. All right, This is a performance L dyno. It's really important that we serve our PHP uh, one line of HTML on these expensive dynos. And I'm going to run them up here. Okay, We've got 10 of them now. And I have on my application here still this, this browser right now, right? Except now it's running on the biggest possible dyno we have, which has a huge amount of memory. And it's got 10 of them processing all of those in, in, in um, Rotation. So as a new request comes into the Heroku platform to one of these dynos, that dyno becomes busy right, until it finishes processing the request. But we have a Heroku routing layer that dynamically routes those requests round robin to all of these dynos as they scale up. And now let's say that our Oprah emergency is over. right? And we're going to go back down. So we scale back down to 1. And we did not pay these numbers that you saw on the screen. We paid prorated to the second only what it cost us to run that dyno. That's the promise of Heroku, right? So if I go back down here and I set this dyno like this, I also have the option to enable, um, let's see here, to enable auto scaling. Presumably. What I'm trying to do is get that thing to let me go back up to this dyno type, and we're not doing it. In any case, I was going to show you this thing in five seconds, and I don't have time to show you auto-scaling anyway. The 
thing that I just showed you where these dinos are scaling up, they scale back down automatically. You do that in response to user traffic, and you get to sleep in on Black Friday for the rest of your life as a developer. And you will be the only one on Earth who gets to do so. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate very much your time. Have a lovely day.